Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is the American Muslim Experience. I'm here. My name is Zaki Hassan. I'm here with Pervez Ahmed. Yes, it is. And I am Pervez Ahmed. And it is good to be here. And uh, good to be sitting with you on a Saturday morning. It, this is what we do. I, I, I used to watch uh, cartoons. And now I act like a cartoon. <laughs> yeah, so the journey is complete. And uh, I guess a few days late, but a happy 40th birthday to you. Thank happy you so birthday. much. Yeah, Thank you right. so much. It's, uh, you know, people are like, are you depressed? And I said, why would I be depressed? I, I, it's nothing wrong with being 40. I'm like it. six weeks away from being 45. That's, I, I was, you know, it's, it, I'll tell you, this is somebody, no shame. Was, some, somebody was asking me like, what, what is your lesson now that you're 40? Like I'm some like, like I'm the sensei in Kung Fu, you know? And, and, and this is what I said to them. And I, I said, one thing I've found, and I'm not going to say this is what all 40 year old people do. Certainly for me, as I've gotten older, um, I don't care as much about being right. And I just try to enjoy being. Mm. And I find that I'm a lot happier that way. Now that is very wise, That's Sensei. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> You've reached the age of Islamic maturity. <laughs> you have. Well, they consider, inshallah. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. You're still considered youth until you're 40. Until you're, uh, uh, uh oh, yeah, okay. Right. We should like create some American Muslim tradition around turning 40. I think we should. You know, yeah. and it's like, like a, put do a play on bar mitzvah. Dude, that's right. But like make muslim it'd be fun. <laughs> as long as I can still eat my fruity pebbles. Okay, sure. <laughs> But the other voice that you're hearing yes. is... Yeah. So our guest for this episode, we are so honored to have Justin Mashouf with us. And, and this comes after a yeah. a, a lengthy uh, scheduling struggle. And, and we're so <laughs> glad to have him in the studio with us. So Justin is a four-time Emmy Award winning filmmaker and artist living in Los Angeles. He received his BFA in media arts from the University of Arizona in 2008. He made the 2009 documentary Warring Factions. And his latest film is The Honest Struggle, another documentary. Uh, here to tell us his story, Justin Mashouf, thank you for joining us at Hub925 in Dublin, California. And Armar, thank you for running audio for us. Thank As you, always. sound man. Thank you, sound man. This is a beautiful space. Thank you guys for having me. Um, it's uh, I, I've listened to your show so much, and I was like, man, I'd love to be on it. So when we were like, I think chatting on iMessage yeah. from time, we were just like, yeah. let's do this thing. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for uh, reaching out and making this happen. Um, but yeah, you're you're. Uh, I, we've had so many guests on who. It's funny because you know, again, we we start weaving this or not weaving, but shedding light on this weaved tapestry it, it, of folks. It's pre-weaved. That's right. It's already weaved for us. Uh, we're shedding light um you know i was there was a word that fascinated me and i was like you know what i think this is i think it, it speaks to me and, and a stenographer and i and i really see mm. our uh, what we do or at least what we try to do and attempt to do here as being kind of like stenographers we're just like shorthanding or we're trying to you know tell this story in this narrative uh in the best form and fashion we can in these little snippets of uh snippets of like the, the, this podcast in this episode and that's what a stenographer does right shorthand for a narrative. I, I, I well, I, the metaphor I would yeah. use is it's like it's like the the sculptor, and people say, "Oh, how did you make this amazing statue?" And, and the sculptor says, "Well, the statue was already there. I just moved all the stuff out of the way." Mm, wow. I feel like we're just we just kind of get right. out of the way and we let people. You that's know. right. That's right. Um, no, but but I was I, I I brought that up because you know you are Southern California, but by way or yeah yeah Southern California by way of Arizona, mm-hmm. you know, and we've had jihad on the show and we've had others on the show who kind of had that interestingly same story. Um, so yeah, I guess you grew up early on in Arizona. Yeah, Tucson. I was actually born in Philadelphia. Oh, okay. uh, originally, and then and uh, yet that I, is another part of. If you've heard enough episodes, yeah, exactly, you would be I don't know guest number some you know something who's been from hails from Philly. Yeah, man, you, you're in the you're in the presence of people like Dr. Jackson and yes, others. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, Dr. Jackson. Of course, I wish I knew him when I was in Philly. <laughs> <laughs> I would have probably made less mistakes in my life. Oh, <laughs> but right. we, uh, yeah. it, you know, I moved from Philadelphia when I was about nine years old. My dad. I wanted to, my dad's a physician. He wanted to retire at the age of 53. Hmm. And uh, the way he did that was by being extremely frugal and <laughs> and saving and then moving us to Tucson, Arizona, which the standard of living was like crazy low. Huh. Um, okay. So we moved to Tucson, Arizona um, when I was nine. And, um, you know, after graduating from the University of Arizona, I moved to, to LA because I studied film and television. Got it. Um, and so, like, what is your background, Mashouf? Oh yeah, Mashouf is actually yeah. it's. Uh, I mean, it's Iranian is my background. My my mother is of European, uh, Irish German descent. Um, my dad comes from Tehran. He came before the revolution in the late sixties, um, as a doctor. Um, you know, I have a, a half brother, and uh, 
you know, my last name is actually technically means happy, mm-hmm. you know, so we are of like happiness and it's definitely true in my family. We have, <laughs> we have a long line of, of jokers and comedians. <laughs> That's great. That's great. No. So you, you talk about uh, pursuing a film education yes. and, and uh, you and I are fellow travelers in that regard. Yeah. But, and, and while that's much more common now yeah. among the most, the, the youths, <laughs> uh, I don't think that was the case. Youths. No. As youths. The youths. The, the youths. The, the youths. <laughs> <laughs> like in my cousin Vinny. Uh, so what uh, what what took you down that path? I'm assuming yeah. you came at it as like a film fan. Yes, absolutely. Um, I um, was a huge film fan um, growing up, middle school. Like all of our, like we had a very, I went to a like a very nice public school. It was like the best public school in Tucson. And we had this like really good drama program mm. and like, you know, all of the best stuff, you know, and part of one of the things that I like to do because I had my access to my dad's camcorder hmm. was instead of doing like we would make a play like a proper drama but I'd be like but let's like do a video version of it because you know there's certain things that you can't do in drama that you can not or on th- on stage that you can do in cinema right so um early exploration with with camera with editing and all of those things um, and re- really pushed me actually towards you know learning the craft of editing which now I'm a professional editor by by trade um, is uh, kind of my love for you know breakdancing and hip-hop you know huh. I started breaking in like 99 and um, in the early days when you're learning you're just constantly like filming yourself right so we had a group of friends it was about four guys and one guy had a camera and we were just like we were always like filming our sets like you're always looking for your mistakes, how you can, you know, move forward. How can you can learn from the falls? And so obviously you always want to build those highlight clips and make yourself look dope. So yeah. that was the early days of myself just learning how to use Avid. You, you're learning how to use like sure. the very, very. So this is like early 2000s. Yeah, this is early 2000s. Yeah. Uh, and by that time, um, when I actually started digital editing in high school, we had, you know, the the colorful IMAX oh that God. had, um, you know, the, I forget what version of Avid it was, but it was actually actual very like pared down version of Avid. Okay. And uh, so I learned to edit of uh, just basically trying to put those clips together. And and Avid for people listening yeah. who might be lost. Avid, I just a- realized. And for your third, in the third person city. <laughs> <laughs> so Avid, Avid was uh, kind of a breakthrough because it was, if not the first, one of the first non-linear editing systems. So in other words, before that. And so I went to film school. I started mm-hmm. film school in like 99. Mm-hmm. So we were we were transitioning from linear to non-linear. So, so like now... I mean, it's 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 funny because I feel like Justin and I will sound like dinosaurs because there's mm-hmm. a sense of like you have to get your dad's camcorder. And yeah, you, do, you know. Now it's like, well, you just uh, take out your your iPhone and you make. I mean, yeah. you know, my my niece who's like thirteen is making movies. You know. Yeah. And and the, it there was work involved and yeah. and the the specific. It's funny because you talk about editing and that was. Uh, when I went to film school, that was the thing that I really plugged into because there's like a discipline involved mm-hmm. and you can create. You, it, the idea of taking all these pieces and let's make something out of this yeah. was, uh, you know, there was, it was, there's like a Zen to me about that. Yeah. You know? Um, I remember, uh, you know, the, the, one of my editing classes, I, I, at the end I told my teacher, I was like, I call this Zen and the art of film editing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's really what it is. And it's just, you take this piece, you move it here, you move it, you know, and you can, you change the entire dispensation of a scene. You yeah, know? that's right. And also you're creating the illusion of basically not of there not being a camera, right? The yeah, idea that, right. you know, you're watching life unfold and there's a certain rhythm that you learn to basically make a film look like it's not like it's real life, mm-hmm. you know, that it's not like, oh yeah, well there's a camera to the right. And then now <laughs> right. we're switching to the camera that's far away on the left. That's showing like, you're not thinking of those when you watch a movie. Right. And that's the job of the editor. The, it's like, the goal Goal is invisibility. Yes. Invisibility. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. If if you notice the edit, then something's wrong with it. Probably. Yeah. Oh well, I mean, I, I, it's funny you say it because you know, the, you, the, I was again as someone who's just a consumer of the art as opposed to a creative or making involved in the discipline, as it were. Um, you know, I, what I noticed. I mean, even just watching, you know, and we'll get to this, but the honest struggle is 
the way you do frame and capture a shot and it's so fluid and I mm. think that that has to do with the fact that you have that background in editing yeah. whereas some filmmakers don't and they rely on an editor like I always hear about like oh you know well you know like like you know, Tarantino films in the progression because Tarantino you know he used to work with this one editor and now he no longer works with that editor and so people talk about how post whatever maybe the hateful eight or, or I guess post uh, uh, Django you know he's been kind of working with this new editor and, and and so he isn't as constrained anymore, and maybe that there's some loss in that Tarantino. Yeah, anyway, so sure, sure, right. Sure. And so I, you know, I, I seeing that or, or having you talk about that without even knowing your background in editing, now I see it because, like I said, I was I was noticing that not in a sense of like you said, noticing the cut or the edit, but just noticing how you're able to tell this like or, or like there's a scene I remember with with the. Uh, with the uh, Sadiq like just coming out of this, he's he's coming out of a car. But the way you are switching angles, and you're being able to tell and frame this entire, just that scene of him coming out of a car, I was just fascinated by mm -hmm. it, just watching it even. And now you're talking about editing, but anyway, so yeah, 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 so yeah. I, 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 it's fascinating, <laughs> to me. but uh, yeah, sorry, you were you were you were talking about um your. Yeah, I think you, you brought I, I mean, that up. And, and yeah. if I can just just button the point we're making mm -hmm. about sure. editing, yeah. you know, um, I remember back in. The 98 Oscars and, um, you know, that was when Titanic was up for like everything. right? Mm -hmm. And they asked Cameron earlier, uh, either either that day or the day of, uh, uh, of how will you know if you're having a good night? And he said, if we win best editing, I know we'll win best picture. Mm. And I've never forgotten that. That's wow. interesting. Isn't that interesting? And that's pretty much that's borne out because if the editor does their job right, that's that's the yeah. that's the final yeah port of call before it reaches the the, the viewer when you right. think about it right well now famously so right i mean and again I, i'm justin perhaps too but you and i are huge star wars geeks but like yeah. a new hope i mean yeah and the role that it his was wife saved and, in the edit mm -hmm. that movie right you know yeah. star wars was famously like the they in in post they added the notion um of the death star bearing down on the rebel base mm -hmm. and when you realize that that was done in post, you you realize when you watch the film. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, so a lot of things are are saved in the edit. You yeah. know, I've I've made films before, and you know, people have gone and like complimented the actors and been like, yeah, that was amazing. You did such a great job. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, like, yeah, man, I saw I saw those, a lot of takes. I saw those dailies, <laughs> man. It was a lot of takes. And guess what? Sometimes the best performance is is before you say action. Right. Right. You know, especially when it comes to reactions, uh, you know, you may catch somebody in an off moment when they're just like not even they may be just in their own head thinking about what the they ate for breakfast. And then you cut it in and they're like, that was the most emotional performance ever. And you're like, guess what? He was he was thinking about eggs Benedict. <laughs> that's like that's like Oliver Reed in Gladiator. Yeah. Yeah. Where, you know, his final, because he, uh, he died. They didn't have a, an right. exit for his character. Uh -huh. And so his final line was literally a thing he said after they called cut. It was yeah. just an end of a take. Amazing. And he's like, shadows and dust. Like, he just <laughs> said it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, so so, so you're, you're in L.A., and now, now you made a choice to go down the documentary path. Yes. So and basically, uh, I'll, I'll describe kind of what happened. So I uh, went to film school. Um, I wanted uh, initially my plan was to go to a California like more prestigious film school. And what happened was I was like, okay, the units that I was taking like it was complicated and all and all this. So then I found out that University of Arizona had something called a BFA program, mm -hmm. and it was like a very specific program for directing. And I was like, man, okay, so if I'm not gonna like spend all this crazy money going to California, spent, you know, out of state tuition, which would have been bananas. Let me just stay here yeah. and, um, take the L add an extra year on to my, to my program. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get this special kind of like, you know, uh, program and yeah. get, get special attention. We had like great access to equipment and all those things. We actually were able to like learn how to shoot on film cameras. We shot, you know, uh, 16 millimeter Bolex type, uh, oh, you know, nice. things oh, we learned wow. how to like, okay. you know, develop film, all that stuff. So we, we got all that. And did you, did you handle that Bolex? Like it was a baby. Oh my God. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a, it's a film camera. Mm. So it's actual film. Right. And so it's like, I mean, it's just, it's all like mechanical the springs and all this madness. And you have in to it. load the film in. It's like actual. Yep. Wow. What did you shoot on? Like 16? Yeah, yeah, sixteen millimeter celluloid film. Yeah. And the and the film itself was so expensive. Like, I because I went to Columbia, right? And in Chicago, yeah. And like, first of all, 
thank God my parents were willing to not only do this, but they paid out of pocket. Yeah. Which I will always be grateful for. But like a big chunk of that tuition was just film, like a film role. And man, if you don't like protect that film with your life, you know, and and it was like five, it was like a, for us, it was like a five minute reel. It wasn't a lot. Yeah. (laughs) And then you got to pay for it to be, you know, properly, you know, uh, you know, uh, taking you with chemicals and process and all those things. And they bring it back, they develop it and you edit with it anyway. So, uh, went through this film program and in that final year, that was basically the only thing I had to do was, uh, finish that BFA program, Mm -hmm. it was like your capstone, right? Okay. And your thesis film. And so I had no other classes. There was no other obligation for me. So I just had basically this like two classes that I was taking. And with that time, I made Warring Factions. So the assignment was to make like a 13 minute short. And I was like, I have access to all this equipment Mm -hmm. and I have literally a full year and only two classes. Hmm. I'm making a feature doc here, you know? So uh, went to Iran, the film is about like, Iranian American identity, um, you know, who I am and, you know, you know, b-boying and who, why that's an important part of who I am and then going to Iran and finding breakdancers in Iran. Um, so went there, made that film. Um, so, so you, you were able to marry your love of breakdancing. Yes. And your love of film. Yes. And, but I mean, how, how do you, how do you get, how does that pop into your head where you're like, exactly, I'm doing a feature. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know what, I mean. All things, all good things are from Allah, right? You know, sure. so he was just pushing me to to go huh. the extra mile, right? Because obviously, I, yeah, I could have just been a burnout and hung out and did a thirteen minute, you know, thing. But I, my my thing is that I wanted the skills because I wanted this feature to land me my next thing. When I'm okay. able to go to L.A., yeah. right, I can do film festivals, then I can move into the next. And you know, back in the day, you know, there was opportunities to do film festivals and really like make a big splash. Okay. Um, now things are very a lot different, right? It's been yeah. democratized in many ways that like, yeah, you may not even have to do a festival to like just explode, yeah. right? Um, anyway, so made the film, um, finished it. We did some film festivals. I came to LA and I was just crashing on my cousin's couch hmm. until he was, and he was a professional editor and he was like, listen, like if you stick it out and you stay, stay along long enough and you know, you, you put your ear to the ground, you'll be able to get get work. Yeah. Um, and so one of my first gigs I was cutting for, you know, non uh, non-scripted, uh, CBS shows. So the first ones were like entertainment shows that I was cutting. Okay. Um, I, I was actually like so an like, overnight like, assist, like reality shows. Yeah. Like entertainment tonight. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So I was like an overnight assistant editor that I would kind of like collect all of the bits from different events and package them and then deliver them to the, you know, the next day. Um, and that was like my first start, but the guy who hired me, he saw that basically the fact that I was able to like finish like a full length doc, it like, it meant a lot. You mm. know what I'm saying? Like I had all the skills to basically, you know, produce, direct, edit my own, like, you know, full length project. It's like, okay, you're definitely going to be able to handle this work here. Yeah. Um, so that's how I really got my start. And then from there I started working in TV news, cutting specials, um, working at KTLA channel five. Um, and so my kind of love for documentary and news was kind of all in together. And all the while I had started, um, my research for the honest struggle because okay. right around 2009, I got this email from a Christian chaplain in North Dakota. And this is kind of a freaky story. Uh, I was on the MSA in um, in college. So, okay. you know, you have that MSA like board members website and it's got like everybody's email on it. Uh-huh. And this dude was just Googling like Muslim students wow. like to contact. So wow. there were, there could be Muslims that were in touch like pen pals with the, the, with the prisoners. So I was like, man, you found my email. I'm in Arizona. Like I'm so far away from you and you want us to like write to the prisoners. I was like, of course, you know? So I started corresponding with this, this one guy in particular, his name was Elijah. And, um, I was like, man, this is fascinating. It's like, and it's like Allah's way of telling you, like, you need to look into this, mm, you know, this is like, wow. this is your next thing. And I had, I had, so m- this was when this is in, this is until like 2009. 
Yeah, you said too. Okay. okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And I think, uh, you, I mean, you and I were talking off air. I, I think last time you and I met was around circa 2010. Yeah. Um, you had a, you had a, you, you did a free, uh, a film screening of Warring Factions at Tet Leave and mm-hmm. you had to sit down with Osama. It was like a, in conversation with, but, uh, and, and you were talking about how the idea had already, the seed was already planted. By yes, then, absolutely. By then, for the, for the, for the for honest this struggle. Film, yeah. For the honest struggle. And yeah. I was trying to like raise, raise initial funds for it, you know, okay. because I was just like, you know, working full time and, you know, trying to figure out like, okay, how am I going to do this? You know? So I was reaching out really to communities, not just for funds, but also for like, for insight, mm-hmm. you know, about mm-hmm. this story. So, um, so yeah. but, 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 but by then what, what was the idea? So you, you were, you were talking about how you started uh, corresponding with someone in prison, yes. Elijah, and he was where? He was in, uh, he was in, he, by that time yeah. he was released. Um, and he was in, he was in Iowa because so like, what was the need that the chaplain identified? He's like, look, I'm a chaplain, but but these guys, these inmates are mostly Muslim. Yes. That I'm, that I'm, that they I'm, were asking him religious questions he couldn't answer. Uh, so oh, he wow. just Googled okay. MSAs or any mm. Muslims he could contact. Exactly. That's Sitting amazing. In, yeah. yeah. It is amazing. Like, yeah. Sitting in uh, North Dakota. North Dakota. You said. Yeah. Right. So he searched the entire state, probably yeah. found zero Muslims. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like not enough Muslims on the internet, right? Nobody had a website, right? <laughs> right, right. So Arizona, it's not yeah. that far. Okay. Wow. So, okay. So then you start corresponding again. Old fashioned sending yep. mail, and what was like? What was what were those early correspondences like? What, like That's I mean, that question. that must have opened you up to an entire w- new world that you probably were not familiar with. Yeah, I, mean, I know. Yeah, I absolutely. Been, so he not. was like the early conversations were really like, you know, who are you? Yeah. Like, you know, where do you come from? And all that. He was a white dude, and uh, he converted to Islam. There was this Kuwaiti brother that had been locked up on some like kind of money laundering kind of type cl- crime, and he was he was like doing solid dawa in the in the prison. So he had identified Elijah because Elijah was going to the meetings of Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh. Okay. And so I think what this dude was doing, he was kind of like poaching the Jehovah's Witnesses because he's like, he knows that like, yeah, yeah. you know, Jehovah's Witness, as far as Christianity, like you're you're kind of like edging that line of like being Muslim tohid wise, right? right? And so he was like, uh, you know, what do you know about Islam? Da, da, da. Gave him a Quran and everything. And uh, I was like, man, that's so trippy. That's, that's so interesting. And, he, you know, he found a lot of validation. He found a lot of protection in the prison. And also as being a white dude, it was yeah. kind of a big deal, right? Because when you make that break, break oh. from, you know, hanging out with whites in prison to hanging out with Muslims in prison. It's kind of like, Ooh, okay, like what's happened here to Elijah, right? Yeah, yeah. And he said that like he had this, uh, he also was like kind of in a bit of a crisis because when he was locked up, his, like his father is uh, part Native American. And he was like, so I was kind of like hanging out with like the other Native folks in, in the prison. But they like weren't really open to me because I wasn't very familiar with them. And like, it was very complicated. So he was like, you know what? I started attending all these religious services. Like, okay, like where do I fit in all this? Mm. And, uh, and then when he was introduced to Islam and the Muslims, he was like, all right, like, this is like, this Mm. is like where I belong. Now he was, he, he was also in, this is federal prison. I'm assuming this was, I believe he was in, I believe he was in federal prison. Yeah. Cause you said a Kuwaiti and it was also probably white crime. Yeah. yeah, The the Kuwaiti was in for like a white crawler, call it crime, but no, 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 no. He was oh. on, uh, he was on, uh, like, uh, methamphetamine pr- uh, charges. And just, they all meet in, like, gen pop. Like, I don't know how that works. So yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Prison. Okay. So it's like, mm. they yeah. met in, yeah. I think they just met it, like, you know, during, uh, like, chow. That's what, you know? right. That's what I'm saying. Like, you meet someone in gen pop, as they call it, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And then... I only know that because I watch like certain TV shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, that's terrible. <laughs> like such a yuppie. I know exactly. Yeah, Jim well, Pop. I'm like, dropping these names like I'm, you know. Yeah. But anyway. Um, <laughs> well, on prison break, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there was this one scene. <laughs> Uh, so yeah. so so Sorry. taking it taking a step backward mm-hmm. just when you, we look at the art of documentary filmmaking mm-hmm. uh to some extent it's as opposed to narrative it's like it's filmmaking without a net mm-hmm. because you start out with a broad concept but yeah. i mean there's no guarantee yeah for sure that your hypothesis will be proven or, That's right. you know what i mean so it's it's riskier in many yeah. ways. My initial idea for the film was this very complicated um, kind of, I don't want to call it a scheme, this po- uh, this complicated kind of like theme of exchanging letters and notes, right? Mm-hmm. Because basically when you, one of the th- important things about Islam in the prison system is that 
these guys create such a solid brotherhood uh, on the inside. And it's like Islam in a vacuum, right? Because mm. it's like none yeah. of the regular rules of society really apply. It's a different rule, like like rules of, of the prison and of the prison culture. And then you have your group of Muslim brothers, you know, brothers that you get together all the time. You eat together, you pray together, you mm. talk together. And you're just like, basic, it's, it's imagine just like always being at the masjid, right? And then we like, but also it's like a hyper uh, dangerous in many ways, right? right? So it's like being in the masjid in like, let's say the 13th century, right? <laughs> okay. That there's like thieves sure. and thug thuggery happening that, you, you know, you guys have to have each other's back because wow. there's stuff that's wow. happening around you yeah. that like, not only do we have to pray together, but we also have to like lock arms and like sometimes carry weapons and protect one another, right? Wow. And uh, there's also the very complicated systems of, of, of politics that happens in the prison, right? Because different groups, they may get into to conflict, right? So you have, you know, uh, you know, when I learned, especially from, from Elijah, like they had like this position in their community called the Sharif and that was security, but it was also conflict resolution. So like, let's say the Latin Kings, which is a, which is a gang that's very prevalent in the prisons. Uh, you know, they have an issue with one of your members because that member may have stolen something from a Latin King or beat a Latin king up. Mm -hmm. So then it's the Sharif's job to talk to the head of the Latin kings and say, listen, we know that Ahmed did this thing to you, mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to try to handle this in another way rather than making it physical because if we make this physical, we are all going in on this. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. then we're going to create a war. Right. So let's do this. We are going to get you like let's say uh, a lot of things in the prison are dealt with in commissary, right? Yeah, and commissary right. is like basically like extra food and like snacks and things like that. But they're very valuable in the prison because the food that you get is just junk, right? right. So it's like, we're going to get you a case of cigarettes and, uh, you know, like 10 cans of tuna fish, right? And it that's going to be ex in exchange for, you know, just like us squashing this right now and like, let's keep the peace. That's and so I was like, man, this is like... The most fascinating thing I've ever fascin heard of. So is. anyway, the initial idea was to kind of given that idea that Muslims are so connected on the inside in prisons is the idea when somebody comes out, they don't have that. Right. Oh, and wow. that's one of the big issues that people have is like, I can't connect to my brothers. So it was going to be delivering messages from brothers that were released recently released and delivering it to the community on the inside. Right. Because by law, okay. this dude who's on parole cannot go back in to get seek support from his brothers and vice versa, obviously. Right? right. So the okay. idea was like to kind of have these video messages and then I would film the messages and then I would take them on the inside because technically they're not in communication. They're just like sending yeah. these messages. I'm a middleman. Right. And then I would film the reactions, right, of these guys and kind of that was that was like the <laughs> early idea. Amazing. But so many, uh, there were so many barriers like that I had. Just, and as just an logistical, logistical, legal, legal uh, right. just bureaucratic through the prison. Right. They were like, okay, well, who's your broadcast sponsor? And I'm like, I'm just like an independent <laughs> filmmaker. Like now, and it's just me. Right. Yeah. So I, I didn't have like a producer to be like, all right, well, like, yeah. let's work for six months on trying to get a broadcast sponsor, pitching them the idea about Muslims incarcerated yeah. that that's its own journey that probably would have taken three or four years to do. And I was like, you know what? Forget about this this idea when I had found uh, the story about uh, Iman's green reentry program. Okay. I was like, man, they're like trying to do this. They're trying mm -hmm. to replicate the community inside of the uh, inside of the Muslim prison community on the outside. Right. And identify these guys as leaders. So in 2010, I actually discovered Iman. Um, I went to, I was invited to take into the streets by Asa Joffrey, uh, who you guys need to interview. <laughs> he was the former arts and culture lead at, in Chicago at okay. Iman. And now he's, uh, he's one of the, the big wigs at, uh, at um, Doris Duke. Oh, wow. So he he brought me out to screen warring factions okay. in uh, for taking it to the streets 2010, okay. and so I was introduced to Iman through that. Learned about their green reentry, uh, or at that time it was called Pro um, Project Restore. Learned about that. And Project Restore became a oh, group. Yeah, exactly. Green, that became yeah. green reentry. Green reentry. So didn't know that. Okay. met Rami. Talk to him. I was like, "Hey, man, I really want to do a documentary about yeah. this whole thing that you're doing." And right. Kind of got the thumbs up and handshake from him, and the kind of that was the rest. You know, that was the rest of the story. A lot um, of times, that's all you need is that thumbs, so, thumbs up and handshake from Rami and Yeah, yeah. man, <laughs> Rami is a beautiful person, amazing, he really amazing is. man. Yeah, you sit with him for five minutes, and you're just like, "Okay, there's something really remarkable <laughs> about this person." Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So, I mean, um, yeah, someone we have to have on the show, I mean, it goes without saying, but uh, someone who I, I've just had the good fortune of spending a lot of time with, and he's just a beautiful person. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, and they're doing amazing work, and, and, and we've had so many guests who have their stories connected to Iman. I mean, you know, like a few, ep- like whatever, maybe a couple of months ago, it was, you know, Dr. Swad spoke, and it mm-hmm. all focuses on the work that Iman is doing there. And what's crazy is yeah. that I met a no. lot of those people, right. like through Iman, right? Because right. I met Dr. Suad at Streets. Yeah. You know, like I met all, it was such a collection of like Muslim thinkers, like yeah. filmmakers, intellectuals, artists, that it was just like an explosion of my my whole world, right? I hadn't because, even heard of Brother Ali until yeah. the Streets. And, and then of course, then I realized who Brother Ali was. Yeah. Of course, the person we've had on the show before. Um, but yeah, so, so talk about, so talk about that then. So by then the idea had already become... Or yeah, I, I guess when you got when when you were introduced to the work that that Iman is doing more specifically with the uh, green reentry, mm-hmm. um, wh- where does Sadiq come? Like, where does yeah. that story begin? Yeah. So in 2010, I started filming like just the 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 gr- the framework and uh, learning the main characters of who was Iman, like what you know how Iman worked and how the the reentry program worked. And then I wanted somebody that was basically went through the program from A to Z, mm. somebody who literally came out of uh, incarceration, arrived at Iman, and then stayed there until they paroled out. Mm-hmm. You know, until they were off their parole. Um, so until to, until Sadiq, basically nobody filled that. There was people that were coming in, that came in and out of the house, but they weren't people that had like just like arrived from the train station from jail. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? That that hadn't happened. You know, it was like people that had been out for six months. Okay. They had been living with family, but it wasn't a great situation. So they moved. And then also Sadiq too. He really opened his story up to me in a very big way. Like huh. he was very trusting with his story with me. And I think that had a huge impact because, I mean, I, I I talked to so many people who went through the house, but right. not to say that they were hiding things from me, but you can tell as a documentary, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, like, all right, man, is this guy going to stop talking to me tomorrow? Like, because if it if that's the case, like, I need to know right now. That's right, because you're investing all this time and yeah. resources already. But I, I you know, we I think we, we, we talked about green reentry, but we didn't really talk about what they do. So yes. Th- th- there's a physical space. There's a house. Yes. Uh, and it- now there's multiple houses. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's meant to be kind of this half- halfway house. Yes. Um, it's close to Iman's headquarters? Very close. On the south side. Yes. Okay, got it. And uh, and brothers come in and out. Yes, and, and, I, and Rami teases or talks about it on in in the, in the movie. But there's this uh, application process. I mean, yes. there's an actual inner. You know, they, mm-hmm. they're very careful about who is selected. Yes. to be in the house. Yeah, which is very different from a lot of reentry homes because a lot of reentry homes they call them housing first, right? It means um, like you know you come out, it's time for you to go, and you get a choice of. Uh, uh, so that's like you know you're getting out applicants that are coming from everywhere. And you just have to take them because the state is going to give you money per bed. Now I don't know the logistics of how. Iman has done this. I mean, they have outside funding, so they don't have to rely on the Illinois Department of Corrections to just like give them money for the beds. Uh, So they can be picky. You know, mm-hmm. and their process is, you know, they're connected to chaplains. They're connected to people that are formerly incarcerated that know that they have friends that are that they went to, you know, prison with mm-hmm. and they spent time with so they can vouch for them. Mm. Um, and then, you know, they evaluate all the letters and uh, then they do phone interviews uh, with guys that are that are about to come out. And uh, now they've recently started a, a women's green green reentry program. Um, I'm not sure if they have an actual home for them. I imagine they probably do. Mm-hmm. And now, like the system is so amazing. So basically, just to finish that kind of that note, right? The guys come out, they come into the home, and then they receive like education, job training, education on doing. Uh, home rehabilitation, because one of the things that, uh, you know, Rami recognized in around that time period, right, during the economic crisis, um, there was so many homes that were um, uh, foreclosed on, right? So many homes that were foreclosed on. And huh. there were all of these properties that were just like, people were squatting in them, and it was just creating kind of like havoc for the neighborhoods. And so, um, what their kind of idea was is like through funding, through grants, they're able to kind of scoop these houses, train these guys on rehabbing them, and then creating homes for more brothers that are coming out. And then eventually those guys with those same skills are able to build enough for themselves. They can buy the houses themselves. That's amazing. So you're creating this like ecosystem. I was just about to say an ecosystem where, yeah, the, the, the work's being done by folks working or, or is connected to Iman. Yep. And then they're 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 building out or they're refabbing or yeah rehabbing these houses for 
these formerly incarcerated people. Yeah. So it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, and brother Hassan, who's in the film, uh-huh. he just recently was able to, you know, buy one of the homes okay. that, uh, who's I think brother Hassan? brother Hassan is the older brother with glasses yeah, yeah, in the yeah, film. Okay. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So he's like, he was one of the first home administrators. So he was like in charge of like making sure all the rules of the houses are right. thing. Mm. And, um, so, I mean, just amazing people that go through these and, yeah. um, in doing that, they're actually creating what, what Rami likes to call like safe zones in, in the South side of Chicago. Right. So like the area around Iman is like very safe. Like you think of the South side of Chicago and people are like, man, it's crazy. And Mm. then you go to Iman and there's like, we're having an outdoor farmer's market and we're (laughs) having like, we're giving out juices and like, it's like a big difference. So they're actually creating a really like a staple in the neighborhood, right? You're creating, um, you know, people that are coming for adult education, learning like computer literacy. Now they have like ceramics, Mm. Uh, they have an art center. Like just hearing you talk, like like the idea in my head now is like maybe God, maybe Allah hasn't hasn't allowed us to schedule with Rami is because I think we are meant to do like this on the road show, yeah, in Iman on the south side of Chicago. I love that. You there know, you? me, Zeki, and Armar, right? We this, our next road trip <laughs> back to Chicago, though. Yes, uh, but this time south side of Chicago, and we do like yeah, like maybe yeah, timing it around. Uh, on the street, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, to do, uh, yeah. and then also too, streets Community. 2020 is happening, yeah. and that's going to be in Atlanta because Iman has now uh, founded right. a new center in yeah. Atlanta. So, yeah. wow. amazing work they do. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. talking about your process as a filmmaker, mm-hmm. um, I'm curious about the time frame mm-hmm. that you set for yourself because you're not, you weren't beholden to yeah, deadline, anybody, yeah, right. So, so you know, like you said, it's no broadcast sponsor. You're just doing this on your own. Mm-hmm. So. There's like pluses and minuses. I, the plus is you can work at your own pace. Right. But what time frame did you set for yourself? Oof. That's a great question. So basically, Sadiq was released in 2013 and his parole was three years. Okay. So what I said was initially was like, I want to I want to follow this through parole. Right. Okay. And I was just okay. praying. I mean, I, you know, you can never say, you know, because the statistics are terrible is that half of the people that are released are within three years are going to go back. back. Wow. So I was imagining this could go either way, you know, and, uh, it's either going to end really sad yeah, or it's going to add, you know, it's going to end in him being out on, you know, off a of parole and yeah. being able to leave Illinois and do whatever the hell he wants, yeah. you know? And, um, so that was that was kind of the time frame that I was setting for myself, right? Is those that those crucial so three years? Twenty, but but you were already in production. Yes, three years prior. Say. Yes, correct. Because I didn't know where where the subject was going to be. Like okay. I knew it was going to come out of Iman, right? Okay. But I didn't know who it was going to be. You know, yeah. could have been Brother Hassan, could have been Brother Rafi, right. who was one of the founders of Project uh, Project Restore. Rafi is a saint. Man. Yeah, man, he's great. <laughs> so you're just getting all this footage. Yeah, yeah, and you're like, I don't know yet. Yes. What I'm going to do with it. And in the meantime, I'm still having to fundraise, right, to pay for the time that I'm taking off and the traveling. And I was hiring freelancers sometimes to come and shoot and do interviews, do sound people. Everything is cost money, right? So I was constantly having to edit. So like I had to edit these reels together, which was very helpful for my process, right? It's like you're basically having to cut the most important parts of the story to convince people, funders, to give you more money to keep working on it, right? Yeah. And so, alhamdulillah, in 2014, the year after Sadiq was released, I won the ISF, the first ISF National Film Grant. So, nice. big that's, shout that's out. That's the Islamic uh, scholarship, scholarship Fund, fund yeah. based, right? I've, which I'm on the selection committee for. Oh, what? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so they are amazing like that was such a game changer to making this film really? that just like it makes me very passionate about their cause like every time they're like hey can you put this send this your email i'm like send i spam all my friends yeah, hey, yeah. give money to these people because they were the reason i was able to make this film they, me they 20- are doing amazing stuff yes you know, yeah. they've got their fund ra- they've got their banquet coming up I think, coming next up weekend. yes yeah, yeah it's uh, uh october 8th october 8th sorry with maddie hassan yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. Sent you the info. yeah yeah and uh Sumaya is someone i know who used to work with them but now i think she's she, she, she actually can't She's, she's come back. She's, oh, she's, she's back boomeranged. The, yeah, she's back. <laughs> wow, yeah. That's amazing. So yeah, we so, definitely, so that yeah. kicked uh, a couple more coins in the bucket. Oh my and, god, yeah, right? in a big way. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? Again, just someone, not even obviously. I had no. I was not privy to any of this information about your production and, and how you sort of started going out and you knew Iman was going to be if or, or something. The story was going to come out of Iman, as you said. Mm-hmm. But what I what I noticed watching the film was how the south side of the south side of Chicago 
becomes a character in the show, yeah, in, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. in, in, in the movie, and that's just uh, that was one of my that's some of my favorite moments yeah. of the film. Uh, I mean, among so many, and I, I really literally wrote down like parts of the movies that I just I, a movie that I really wanted to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. but one of it was, uh, you know, and now knowing the process of how you were already there filming. But was that organic or was that sort of deliberate in, in the sense of or intentional that mm -hmm. you wanted the South Side and its, you know, its setting, its sure. unique setting to be a, almost like literally a character in the movie? Yeah. I mean, I really fell in love with Chicago while I was making okay. the film. Like, yeah. I was like, man, this place is amazing. You yeah. know, I. Uh, but there's I, Chicago and then there's South Side. Chicago. Yeah, that's true. That's right, very true. Right. I mean, uh, the, the history of like. Like the yeah. black struggle in Chicago is super fascinating to yeah. me because I'm a, I'm such like a a nerd about the history of American Islam, right? Yeah. You know, you have so much that happened with NOI there. You know, right. Imam Worthdeen. That's right. In happening in Chicago, that all of those those forces are there. You know. Zaki and I, uh, we were on our, just uh, yeah on not this last trip to Chicago, but the trip before with Alim, we were um, we went to the uh, Mariam Mosque. Oh yeah, on the south side, or which touching is, which blew my mind. Yeah, blew it's, my mind. it's massive. I had never been to a space like that yeah. in my life in America. Yeah. So and we met with uh, uh, Imam Sultan Muhammad there. Didn't meet with the Minister Farrakhan. No, no we didn't. <laughs> I but didn't I mean, get that, it, but... to me, Imam yeah. Sultan is kind of like the next best thing. That's true. He's a remarkable person as well. Um, but anyway, yeah, so uh, there's a, there's that history, and then, of course, then there's, I mean, Chicago is just rich yeah. in history. Chicago Sharif, as, right, as it's often uh, and, sort of, and it's a history. I mean, yeah. I mean honestly, the, the, the Desi community is, this. is just not plugged in with mm. a certain aspect of it. Mm. I mean, certainly for me, uh, I, I, I told Perez this, you know, I was like, I grew up in Chicago. I was born in Chicago. I lived there for 14 years. I didn't, didn't know, know about yeah. Mr. Marion, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and and it, it's 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 uh, the, I mean, when I when I went to Columbia, we were very relatively close to the South Side, mm -hmm. and I feel like in the you know nearly twenty years since there's been a lot of change too. A I mean, there has been change. gentrification stuff like that too. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I think what's cool is that organizations like Iman kind of bridge that gap between really immigrant have. Muslims really and have. or now kind of really second generation immigrant Muslims yeah. to yeah. like to the black community and black black Muslim community and that's, that, right. that's super important right because and even with Tatleaf like we were kind of deliberate on being on towards the south side yeah. right being in being in the uh, 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 Pilsen neighborhood in, like neighborhood which mm -hmm. is this really kind of like bohemian kind of up and coming you know, gentrified to an extent <laughs> <laughs> I hear the word bohemian I'm yeah. like yeah, I know. <laughs> totally, right? the, the G word it's coming exactly, next. <laughs> exactly. Or that's like the word that people like I to know. use when they don't like to use the G word. <laughs> it's, so true. It's, so true. it's a very bohemian yeah. area. <laughs> you mean they have expensive cookies and coffee? <laughs> yeah, but that's, man buns. That's yeah. Pelson. That's Pelson. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yes, no, sorry. You were yes, you were you were you became fascinated with Chicago. And yeah, yeah. I, I really fell in love with Chicago, with and, and you know you have to understand the lives of the subject matter that yeah. you, and so to do that, you have to understand their surroundings and where they came from. Okay. And I, I partnered with an amazing cinematographer and documentary filmmaker. His name is uh, Sirus uh, Dolat Shahi, who's also a fellow Iranian. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. And he's, uh, the guy is like, he did this film, um, on the South side of Chicago. And now my, my brain is spacing it, but uh, I looked at his work. Um, I don't even know. I don't even remember how I found him. I think I was just searching like Vimeo for like B roll for like one of my like uh, research roles. <laughs> and I found his, some of his work that he was like releasing some scenes early on. He was doing a similar thing to myself, but like, he was like raising money to make uh -huh. his doc. Right. And so he had this like amazing access uh, with some like South side, you know, Chicago families and like he was in the house. Yes. That's, that's serious. Mm. Uh, and, uh, his style was amazing. Like we're both like big fans of James Longley, who's an incredible, you know, documentary filmmaker. Check out his work. Mm. You're rocking fragments. He has a new film out called angels are made of light based in Afghanistan. Wow. Um, but I looked at his work and I was like, man, I got to work with this guy. Like I got to hire him as a freelancer. Yeah. And uh, he just like knew the spots in, in Southside. Like he loved Southside too. Like, okay. and as an Iranian, like generally our Iranian American community is like not living in the black community. So I found like mm. kind of like another, like yeah. kind of weird, weird Iranian filmmaker like myself. And I was like, oh man, do we got to hang out? Like you live in the Southside, you're, you're documenting this story as well. And, um, you know, his, his eye he and really his patience an for the subject and his willing, honestly, to, to, 
go out of go out of his comfort zone. You know, like while he was working with me, mm-hmm. he got he he got robbed. He got robbed in, in the south side. He was he was Holy on the moly. yeah he was on the red line. He was trying to get back to his place, and we had dumped the footage that we had shot that for that day. And he was getting off the train, and they were like, "Cameras, give him oh, over." Oh man! So he lost oh. his cameras, man. When he was working with me. Uh, it was terrible, uh, but I'm the guy. Super the guy, super talented. Yeah, helped he really me out, is. and he really like helped me capture the South Side yeah. properly, right? Because like whenever I came, I was there for like ten days at a time, ten to twelve days at a time, and I would just like be with Sadiq all the time, mm-hmm. like, and I'd be at the house. So like that was kind of like my realm. Mm-hmm. And then when he was there, you know, he was able to be like more fluid. Like he was also shooting the South Side for his doc as well. So mm-hmm. I'd be like, hey man, like you shot this stuff, I really like it are you going to use it for your film and he's like no 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 this isn't going to i'm not going to use it in my film and i was like hey man i'm going to i'm i'm going to take this from you <laughs> i'm yeah. going to use this please right. <laughs> um so you know incredible guy and that that really captures that essence of chicago yeah he really has an eye and i and I, again I, well, just watching the movie I, I noticed that as well and i mean frankly even the opening shot of just like kind of yeah. down the street and then um, there's the bird, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The bird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing, amazing. Um, but yeah, so so then, h- how does Darrell Sadiq come mm-hmm. on your radar then? Yeah. So yeah, so Sadiq yeah. comes on my radar. Rami gave me a call. Well, okay. I would say I was probably te- I would I was like texting and calling mm-hmm. Rami like every week, being right. like, "Is anybody new coming in the house? Who's coming in the house? What's happening at the house? What's happening at the house?" And as you know, you know, dealing with people that are at that level and organizations, like yeah. you got to be on top of them, man. Mm-hmm. They're not gonna they're not gonna get back to you anytime soon. So uh, Rami, you know, picks up one day and he's like, "Hey, we have this guy that we're gonna interview. He's." musician he seems like a really great fit for the program and i was like please tell me that you're gonna go ahead with it and like let me know when he's coming Mm -hmm. so um because you were like even on paper this guy sounds amazing even on paper he sounds amazing right right? so um was able to go um you know had cameras there when he was picked up from the train station there was a logistical like kind of um weird thing that I think had happened that uh, didn't allow me to be there. But I had, uh, thankfully, you know, had a freelancer that Rami had knew that was there at the train station. And then my, um, kind of Chicago unit producer, his name is Carlos Cortez. He, we worked together in LA and he was moving to Chicago. Mm -hmm. So it was like, man, you're going to be like my, my go-to, like I need a camera in the South side in like 30 minutes, like you need to go and shoot this, this scene. Mm-hmm. Um, so that allowed me a little bit of flexibility. Right. So he shot a lot like that first day, that first week with Sadiq. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and so when you meet it, because to me, again, he, he's so charismatic. Oh like, yeah. Sadiq. And so yeah. I was almost like, I mean, not even knowing the process, but like, I was like, just again, watching the movie was just like, well, you were, you must've been just so blessed that, yeah. you know, obviously everyone has a compelling story, but not only you, you meet this person with this fascinating story, musician, you know, really just talent, just, I mean, and, but on top of talent, just this raw charisma and passion that yeah. he has. Like, yeah. I was like, this is the perfect subject for this movie. Yeah, and <laughs> right? I was just like, this is the guy, man. He's amazing. And, and that's not something you can predict. That's what I'm no, saying. No, not at all. Nothing you can predict. <laughs> yeah. Everybody but that came before Sadiq were very soft-spoken, right. very okay. like, See? you know, like, I don't want to say typical Muslim, but, you know, like, we have a certain level of, like... It's just, it's, it's, it's kind of, it happens like within, within our communities, like as people like reach a certain maturity or like in their religious belief yeah. or their piety, they tend to like go inside a little bit more mm. and it's challenging. Like as a, as a documentary filmmaker, you're just like, to get please them to open, up. open yourself yeah. to me. <laughs> like so I need true. you to open a little bit. And but, uh, but, Sadiq was willing to do that. But that also goes to your skill set too. I mean, to that's true. Sort of coax that out. I yeah. mean, that's, yeah. you know what I mean? It's, yeah, 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 yeah. It, there, there's a marriage of filmmaker and subject yeah. that allows yes. that to emerge. You know? Yeah, and we like, whenever I would go, I would literally stay at the reentry house. You know, okay. we'd be hang, we'd eat, sleep, pray together. Like it was just like, you know, all the time we were together. So I would know, you know, like where, and he, Sadiq was always open to camera, always open to shooting. Like I was always shooting in the house and it was probably annoying a lot of the other people that lived in the house. Um, <laughs> but you know, it was something that I was just like always on top of. Cause you always want to catch those moments of humanity, right? Yeah. Because sometimes when we, we sit down for an interview and it's like, we're giving our best selves, right? And we're not allowing ourselves to be vulnerable a lot of times. But in those ordinary interactions with other people, we're able to actually see inside and being like, oh man, like he was really, 
like one of my favorite scenes in the film, and I won't give away too much, is that he's uh, he's Sorry, getting am I giving away too no, much? No, no, okay, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, is that he's getting a, a, his his hearing checked? You know, he had he has like progressive hearing loss, yeah. and so he's um, he's in getting his hearing tested, yeah. and he's like fails miserably at he the does. test, yeah. and uh, the 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 doctor is talking to him about like you know what like why did you lose, you had a hearing aid. How did you lose your hearing aid? And he was like, he actually has to tell her, like I was in, I was in prison, yeah. you know, and I, and things happen in prison. And then this lady is like, white lady is just She's like, so, yeah. yeah, she just like has this reaction. And Sadiq has this reaction. And it's like very human, like, it's so oh true. You man. That. Yeah. That yeah. Is yeah. So true. Because I was almost like, like, wow, lady, you just don't get it. Yeah. Like, meaning, you know, you know, I don't get it. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. but I could just feel I, I, just having him it, like Sadiq be that vulnerable and, and telling her not only, hey, the, hey I go, well, you know, this is what happens when you go to prison. Man. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. I don't, I don't know where my hearing aid is. Yeah, exactly. Like, and, and, and for her, it's just like she, he might as well have been from China and, yeah. and talked about, you know what I mean? Exactly. Like, it was completely out of her realm of something she was even familiar with. And yeah. I was fascinated by that. Yeah. yeah. Just again, as a. As, as a viewer, but uh, yeah, you're, and, and, but so there's moments where you allow, I think the, like you said, like there's that scene or the scene where he meets with his brother out in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many others, like his childhood friend, they're walking and then, like, I remember that, like, they're walking down that street and the L, uh, the L passes. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, did you time that? Because it was just so <laughs> it was perfect. So perfect. <laughs> it was so yeah. perfect. But anyway, so again, I'm, I'm giving away too much. But uh, but I, I hope they're just teases because people, you really got to go check out the movie. But And, and we'll get it how people can check that out in sure. a moment. When do you interject yourself? Like, <laughs> because there's moments where they're off air, right? I mean, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. off camera. Yeah. You ask the question. Yeah. When do you make that editorial call? Like, I got to, I got to intervene here yeah. because I, I want the, I want this, you know, I want to expose something or get yeah, into something. Yeah, I want to expose. Yeah. So that, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy because it's always like subject to like hours of thought and debate with people that are consulting with the edit and consulting with the film and right. stuff like that. And one of my things Cause about, you're doing that a lot, but only mm -hmm. some moments of those actually make it's it a on. couple. Yeah. It's like Got very it. few, it's like very few times that I, I allow for it. And, right. um, part of the, th one of the things and kind of like philosophies I learned and kind of developed with documentary filmmaking is that I don't like films or I like my films to at least point to the maker a few times mm. to the fact that, listen, this is a story that's actually being constructed. So just remind yourself just once or twice that you're watching, like you're not watching like a, a movie, like a cinematic, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like a, you're not watching a, a fictional film. So you, you know what I'm saying? Like the fourth wall. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Like breaking that fourth wall yeah. every once in a while just to say like, listen, somebody else is shaping the story. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like somebody else has a hand in it. Like in my first film, Warring Factions, you, I have a few moments of, of first person voiceover that's like very like breaking fourth wall. And um, we have these like scenes that I've recreated um, like memories in my, in my upbringing. So one of them is, which is the day of nine 11, right? The day of nine 11 in the classroom and basically the conversation that happened, but the way we set it up, it looks like a theater play, like on stage. Right. So mm. it's like harsh lighting. Yeah. Like it's like ridiculous. So you see set pieces hanging in the background, you know, like this is a constructed memory, right? Yeah. Because filmmaking is a construction. So we need to re re remind sometimes the audience, I feel like I like to remind the audience that listen, you're, what you're watching is actually a constructed reality. Okay. And, and with documentaries, I think that's especially important because I think a lot of people focus on the word document and yes. they assume it's sort of objective reality. And I, yeah. I tell my students all the time, I'm like, look, it's still in service to a point of view. That's yes, so absolutely. You know? It's it's funny because because um, what you're talking about reminds me of uh, there's a documentary. I don't know if you've seen it. Wiener, the Anthony Wiener documentary. I have. Did you, Based on your have, have you I have, it? haven't seen it. I need that, to see it. That, it's fantastic. I actually, I screened that in my media and society classes and it's a fly on the wall documentary and, and the filmmakers do a pretty good job of staying out of it. But what I love is the one time you hear the filmmakers at the very end, you've got to Anthony Weiner talking to camera and essentially sort of reflecting on this whole thing. And then he just kind of says whatever. And then it, right before we go to black, you just hear the filmmaker. Why did you let us do this? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's such a moment of vulnerability there. That's and then so, it's just yeah, this yeah, beat yeah. Yeah. and then yeah. credits. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, so the, the film itself, before we even talk about how people can seek it out, I, I want you to sort of give your, yeah insights of having been a filmmaker now mm -hmm. for for uh, more than a decade mm -hmm. 
Uh, this is an industry that obviously the Muslim voice is very much needed. Oh, yeah. Um, what what have you learned during your time in the industry as far as uh, best practices to succeed and still sort of stay true to your your Muslim identity? Yeah. Um, first first things first is just be really good at what you do, um, and don't be obsessed with trying like this whole idea of like oh like the first Muslim to do this is like <laughs> get over yourself. <laughs> what the hell are we? doing here (laughs) you know that's so ridiculous like do i have to do i have to like write a press release every time i like do something new that's like the first iranian american uh, to ever you know uh, update his uh adobe (laughs) premiere the creative cloud in 2019 you know um so i think we need to get over that and just be really good at what we do awesome um I've learned um, collaboration and consultation is really important. Um, so sometimes Muslims in in like entertainment and media, we kind of like see each other as like in competition for the same resources. Yes. And it's like, don't do that. That, that, like, that specifically was something I wanted you to, to yeah. talk about. Because that, I definitely – Really seen that? Yeah, it's like how so? Like I mean, without naming names, I guess. Like is it? Oh no, I have a list. Let me. (laughs) Is it? I mean, oh, I didn't think he would do that. (laughs) (laughs) But is it like territorial? Like what? what, what Yeah, it's like yeah, it's territorial. You'll be like you'll 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 be talking to somebody and be like, hey, what are you working on? They're like, yeah, you know, just came back from this thing. Oh, cool. Like, thanks yeah. for the invite. Yeah, yeah. Like, why didn't we didn't why didn't you talk to me about that? Because like, why don't we work together in right. doing that? Or like I'll see somebody had like been working on some doc mm-hmm. on the side and I'm like, you know that I've made two documentaries and I'm an editor and your editing sucks. <laughs> and I could have at least given you some even if I didn't touch it, yeah. I want to at least recommend you to some people that may be able to help you. Why are you trying to do everything yourself? That's the mistakes that I made early mm, on. Yeah. I'm going to do everything myself because but, nobody wants to help me. But you know it's interesting <laughs> the point you're because the point you're making relates to the first point that Zuck, that Zucky wanted you to talk about which mm-hmm. was like or no sorry sorry that that that, that, that you mentioned, which is get over being the first of something. Yeah. Because then I forget who we were on the show, like who we were talking about this with, but we had a guest on and we were getting into this idea of like when you're the only something at a place, like there's this, not only do you become tokenized because you're like, oh, yeah. hey, Muslim, you know, something happens like, okay, you can explain what you, you, you are now left or you are now tasked with yeah. having to speak on behalf of 1.3 billion people because yeah. you're the only Muslim guy yeah. there. But there's also this something that comes from within where you feel threatened then if some other brown dude comes around. Yeah, exactly. Because you feel around. like that's your, your yeah. unique selling point, yeah. right? Do you remember who, who it was? But we I, got I, into, I, yeah, I remember yeah, the conversation. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, exactly. Like, exactly. Yeah. But, but it, what you're describing yeah. kind of reminds me of that. Yeah. Because like you'll have that conversation with say another fel- fellow filmmaker or creative and they're like, th- there's that sense of like, wait, but I'm like the Muslim dude doing this. I'm the yeah, Muslim exactly. documentarian. You're yes, not. Exactly. <laughs> you know, right, 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 right. Or I'm the original. Yeah, it's, I mean yeah. it, it. You know, in in the movie, not another teen movie. There's this. There's like the party, which is Where'd for. You get that? <laughs> it's making fun of the tropes of these right, films, right? right? And so, so there's like a house party, uh-huh. and then there's like the the token black character in the film, of course. And then he's at this party, and he sees another black guy, and he goes up to him. He's like, "Hey, hey." I'm the black guy at this party. <laughs> and the guy's like, it's oh, genius. oh, my bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and he leaves. I, it's, there's a little bit of that. You know? Yeah, because a lot of the times, I mean, there's so much, pr- I mean, all of us want to try to get ahead, right? So we're trying to give ourselves like a special, like unique voice. And yeah. now with the way kind of like entertainment is, you have this like tokenism that's happening that it's like, okay, especially with, you know, 45 in office and just like the hyper like anti-Muslim environment that we have. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are like kind of like liberal Hollywood people that are like, oh, we need to give a voice for these, you know, on you know, these people, right? And they're they think they're doing their best of intentions. And they're like, okay, like so the person who's gonna identify themselves as like the Muslim the loudest or like the most kind of kooky way, we're gonna give them a platform, so right? True. But so maybe true. not necessarily like the guy that's been in the industry for a bit and yeah. like he has like a lot more to to tell or a lot like more range or experience or skill we're just going to give it to the one who's just like screams like the the that'll be best on the poster or something you know what i'm saying so true or fits into that muslim box that like white people have uh, invented (laughs) you know what i'm saying invented no no you're right and and i see that even in i mean like uh, like me and zucky always talk about how like six years ago almost now 
next month when we started this show, I mean, we were like the only Muslim podcast or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, at that time. And the now, first, you know, the first, the first, get Muslim the press release podcast. ready. But, but now, but now, you know, like the space has opened up, but I, I think you're right. I mean, in terms of, there is this sort of like, yeah, liberal Hollywood or liberal, like whatever it is, you know, the American liberalism, if you will, likes to sort of showcase the most flamboyant or the most out there or the most provocative, right? Yeah, provocative. I mean, we, is a good we word. are we are way too non-provocative, so yeah. we're boring, you know, like, yeah. right? Whereas there's another podcast, let's say that 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 talks about or you know, um, sexuality and, mm-hmm. and, and you know, you know, contesting, you know, conserve, you know, patriarchy or whatever may be the case. That's the voice. That's the show, or that's and, the voice. And which is fine, to, by the which way. Which is man, fine, I'm, and I'm not hey, picking on I'm those. I'm glad shows. those voices are sure, out there too. Sure, that's, but I'm saying there is this. What, what what Justin is describing, I think, is very real in terms of what is often used as the hey, let's you know, like let's tell the Muslim story, but let's tell this particular story, yeah, exactly. and, right? but, or but, highlight but, this particular voice. But if I can underscore the, yeah. the point that I think Justin is making, I think it's a very valid one. Don't worry so much about being the best Muslim blank. Correct. Yes, exactly. Just be the best. Yeah, editor, or mm-hmm. the, yeah. whatever mm-hmm. you know, director, director, yeah, you know, and and I think that's that's very valid. Uh, if if people are wanting to to get into documentary specifically, mm-hmm. uh, what are some best practices that you or, you have after ten years in the trenches? Wow, <sighs> things have changed so much though since I started. Since I started, I would say like just like educating yourself on craft, just kind of nerd out on on like documentaries, do a little self education on that. Um, I would say kind of, uh, having a love for, um, for people is really important, Mm -hmm. right? You know, like really understanding that, uh, the idea of context and the idea of, you know, how people become themselves Mm -hmm. is really important, right? It's not putting people in like boxes. Um, and then I would say just like shoot everything, Mm -hmm. you know, like always, always be shooting, you know, um, early on and learning how to do, um, you know, more with less, uh, because in, 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 in early on you have to be, you know, very, um, you know, low key. And uh, my, my general style of film, filmmaking, I love the verite style, right? So like fly on the wall, like one camera person, uh, typically no, hopefully no sound person because the process of filmmaking is very invasive, uh, generally to personal space Mm -hmm. and to our idea of comfort. And it's actually exaggerated based on what culture people are coming from, right? Some, Mm. some people are just more comfortable with the idea of like, cameras and lights and all that stuff mm. other people are like mm, that's gonna make me feel weird and it's gonna affect what you're able yeah. to so uh, record mm-hmm. what you're able to so, document so you're, you are impacting the reality that you're yeah doing. exactly you're impacting the reality so like having having an idea almost even before cameras are are turned on like appreciating radio like appreciating the idea of doing interviews mm. and how how people talk and how you can get people to talk mm. uh learning you know the the skill even like what you guys do um of of getting people to talk about themselves in a structured way, um, and then you uh, call this structure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, right? And then <laughs> and then you know learning the 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 further yeah. craft right of like okay yeah camera lighting all that stuff. But I would say that that stuff comes second to like the human things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because for me, um, I like paring down my setup as much as possible. Right. So um, if possible, I like just basically just being me. And the subject, um, and so that will require, you know, especially when it's like a one-to-one interview or like a one-to-one verite scene. Um, I will just like have recorders placed so that way I don't have a sound person that's chasing, right? And obviously there's technical limitations to it. So having multiple recorders set up throughout the room or or miking the individuals, mm. um, and uh, that way you can actually film them in a in an open wide space. Um, Without without having be oh you know don't don't walk that far it's just too far but the, oh, like oh yeah. the the lights the lights off you know like yeah. you have to learn how to like work within that world and not make the subject you don't want to tie the subject to like your technical limitations mm. right so being as flexible as possible it's like really important um, I feel like for that verite style yeah. um, and now with a lot of newer newer cameras are able to shoot at like crazy high ISOs right. um, you know so basically like the the need for like lighting is like diminishing, right? Obviously lighting for, you know, cinematic and, uh, photography purposes of making the shot beautiful is, 
is is important. But um, for that bare minimum of capturing, the bar has been set like is much lower, right? right? So like when I was you know early on shooting with like you know mini DV cameras, like yeah, you need to blast some light because once you get to a certain level of darkness, yeah. this footage is unusable, mm. right? You've just, just or the done. old Bolex days, where yeah. you're measuring foot candles. And exactly, stuff. Yeah. yeah, old Bolex days, which is just <laughs> even you're a whole other level. To yeah, the available light that you have. Exactly, yeah, yeah. and now you know you have cameras that literally just like sh- can shoot in in candlelight you know yeah. and make okay. amazing pictures right yeah. so you're you're less beholden to those those limitations so again things are changing but um one but, thing we'll, but uh, i just like to piggyback on sure. that sure uh you know they they say the absence of limitations is the enemy of creativity that's right that's right and Wait, you know say that again? the absence of limitations is the enemy of creativity right and that's oh i see so meaning to state it differently, having limitations is what yields creativity. Yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, right. I, uh, having to work around right, 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 those right, types right, of things. Right. And so, you know, I what we have now is this ab- abundance of, uh, you know, technology that lets you do all kinds of stuff. But don't stop trying to be creative. Yeah. You know, people people uh, who are coming up in this this era where all this stuff is just so readily available, like I, that's my, I mean, I, not not a concern, but that's my yeah. prediction is that there's going to be a lot more chaff out there mm-hmm. that you have to separate from the wheat. You know? Yeah, no, and, and it, it's already, it's I already agree. happened. There's just, there's yeah. a ton of content, there's like a, everybody yeah. can content create. Content overload. Yeah, it's, it's, it's bananas and it's, um, you know, it's actually interesting. I was reading an article, I forget where it was, but it was about kind of like the environmental impacts of all this madness, wow. right? So, and it's something that like, I think a lot of us aren't even thinking about, right. like is the amount of just nonsense. Imagine all the nonsense, <laughs> like Facebook live videos of people like, just like feeding their dog and cat and like okay that's like taking space on a server that lives somewhere that's being has to be run by electricity <laughs> wow. it has to be cooled by another situation with also use electricity so and you're just like I'm just trying to share myself you know feeding my dog and it's so great thanks Larry we're so, you're killing the planet we're so interconnected but it's like yeah and then it gets so true. it gets stored for the and, rest and of humanity that's completely, <laughs> that's completely separate from these Logan Paul type creatures oh, yeah. who are going into sacred forests and and just yeah. making, making idiots of themselves. Yeah. You know? I, I don't even know what that is. And maybe I don't want to. Yeah. You know, yeah. Okay. Don't even just forget okay. you heard those syllable, <laughs> syllables. <Got> <laughs> well, so, 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 um, the honest struggle, where can, where can people find it? So people can find it on iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Uh, also, for our folks that are in Asia and Australia, we use Pivot Share. So if you go to my website, honeststruggle.co, you'll be able to find a link for all of those links. Also, if you have um, Spectrum or Cox, uh, you'll be able to get the film uh, middle of next month. And um, it's currently available on Xfinity uh, Video On Demand. So if you have any oh, of those wow. cable systems, yeah, you can uh, search in your little Video On Demand and it'll be in the documentary section. Be honest, struggle. It's 60 awesome. minutes long and yeah. you're going to love it. I, I <laughs> highly recommend it. Um, if for nothing else, you get to hear Sadiq belt out Sam Cooke. Yes. One of my favorite scenes. Sorry. Oh, I love it. I love it. And because until then, spoiler, you, you te- I know, sorry, spoiler, <laughs> but I had, I just had to, because it was so, because up, up until that point, you kind of, te- you know, there, there's, you, you, yeah. you know, Sadiq's a musician. Yeah. You're yeah, like, yeah, okay, yeah. He's a musician. But then man, when he, right. He's yeah, out he's just passing out turkey. He's out <laughs> passing out turkey. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And he just starts belting out. Uh, changes are coming. And, oh, wow, and really, he's such an yeah. amazing guy, man. Yeah. Last night we did the Athenian school in uh-huh. Danville, right? It's like a private uh, oh, school. Right up the street here. Yeah. yeah, Danville, yeah. California. Danville, California. Danville, okay. California. Okay. And we were doing Let's the Q and a, sure. and there was a piano there, right? We were like in the, in the, like the drama. Wait, like Sadiq's room. here. Sadiq's here. Yeah. Yeah. What? Sadiq's here. Yeah. 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 Why he's in San Francisco. But what are we doing we talking got, to you? We <laughs> may, we, we may be bringing him back. That's right. So basically, you know, he, um, you know, he, he was just like, there was a piano there and he's like, can I sing you guys a song? <laughs> wow. and it was like amazing. The kids Whoa. and then there was like parents and faculty. They were just like, wow, I amazing. Yeah, oh my God, that's amazing. It was cool. We need so, to get, uh, we need to get a, a piano in Lighthouse Mosque tonight. That's what I was going to say. Because <laughs> last night, Danville, you yeah. have, you're at the Lighthouse tonight. Yes. Is, uh, is, uh, Sadiq, Sadiq will be there. Be there. Sadiq wow. will be there. We're also going to be having a program after that, um, which is uh, which will be with uh, Hashim, uh, Aloha Dean, uh, Brother Sundiata, Amir oh. Rashad, and then of uh, my favorite, uh, David Coolidge. 
<laughs> you guys have to have on the show. I know. We have to have Dave on the yeah, show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Show, show as well. So, what is next for you? What is next for me? Uh, I've been working on a few things. I, uh, you know, Hamda Love has been blessed uh, since uh, you know, two years ago. I had a little boy, oh, and uh, and uh, last awesome. year we had another boy who's also named Zeki. <laughs> it's a good name. Yeah, it's a great served name. me well. <laughs> um, it served me well. <laughs> so just been focusing on family, and um, I have a, a script that I'm trying to develop, uh, as well as some kind of top secret, um, you know, potential uh, work. Um, on Netflix, so oh, I can't okay. really so talk about it. So going into right narrative, areas. yes, nice. exactly. So, so that's kind you of know, we've we've kind of become a thing around that. Where where like for example, we were we were talking off air about having Mukhtar on the show, and mm-hmm. at that time he was teasing a project, mm-hmm. which now lo and behold has become you know the the monk of Mocha. So yep. who knows? Yeah, right. You're teasing this little <laughs> pro- teasing project, thing. and then uh, we get to and then you know three years from now we're like, man, we're so lucky we got Justin before he blew up, uh, <laughs> before he stopped returning our emails. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and been like have. My people contact your yeah. people. That's you, right. guys, can show, you guys can call my agent. <laughs> <laughs> well, where can people find you? Yeah. Oh, uh, me. I'm those. on all social media. I like Twitter the most. Um, my, at Mashouf, M A S H O U F is in Frank. Um, and I, uh, I'm on Facebook as well, J Mashouf. Uh, what else am I on? Instagram, Jay Mashouf. Um, but yeah, man, hit me up. I'd love to, I love it when like young, you know, Muslims that are trying to get into media, they hit me up and for advice, I'll, I'll be on the, I'll take a phone call with you. I love it. Cause nice. I was early on in the early days, you know, like, uh, when, when I finished my first film, like I sent it out to people like, you know, uh, Azhar Osman. Right. Okay. And he actually watched the film. Wow. He gave me all kinds okay. of like feedback and, you know, awesome. it was like, you know, so I, I really appreciate when people, you know, take the opportunity to reach out and like share their work with me and I'm able able to kind of like, you know, help them out a little bit. Very cool. Well, I think that's a great way to leave that conversation, Pervez. Why don't you close up by letting people know where they can find us? As always, thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, you can hit us up on facebook.com slash diffuse congruence. Also check out our Patreon page. Um, We, we, you know, it allows us to do the work that we do. So patreon.com slash diffuse congruence. And of course, Zucky has much more of an online presence and social media presence than I do. And Zucky, you can find Zucky on Twitter at? At Zucky's Corner. That's the A-K-I-S corner. That's also my website. Just add it and uh, you can find my movie reviews at uh, the San Francisco Chronicle website also. Thank you for listening as always and catch us next time.